My name is Travis Bashiris, and uh, welcome to the fourth talk uh, put on by Deer Talks. Um, this name stands for Distinguished Educator slash Innovative Researcher. And throughout this school year, we have posted a wide array of professors, scientists, and entrepreneurs who impair their knowledge uh, of how receiving a strong education propels individuals to successful careers. This club meets every Wednesday at lunch in room F1. If you guys want to come and uh, uh, listen in on other speakers, we have a speaker, uh, we try to have a speaker once a month. Um, and now that's in Mr. Gettler's room. Now before I get going, I would like to thank all of you guys for coming out. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Ms. Foster. She'll be here soon. Um, she helped me set up all this in the cafeteria and organized it with the uh, with everyone, and that was really nice. Um, I also want to thank uh, my club officers, um, Masha and uh, Sarah Kane. So give them a warm <laughs> I would especially like to thank uh, Dr. Elliot for taking his time out of his busy schedule to come talk to all of us. So let's give him a warm. <laughs> now, the reason I founded Deer Talks was because throughout my life I have been inspired by adults with wisdom they have to offer. As we all mature and find our niche in this vast world, we go through many struggles and hardships that, when looked back on, we learn a life changing lesson. It is these lessons I hope the guest speakers share with us so we don't have to struggle through the same hardships that they did. With, this, with that said, these talks are also brought, with, brought to you in order to communicate what teachers, researchers, and people in the workforce do for a living and how they apply what they have learned throughout their life into their work now. One question that rings in my head when I sit through all of my classes is, how does all of this education uh, now, tied to what we will do in the future as adults. Well, here with us today is Marcus Elliott, a Harvard-trained MD who has started a revolutionary gym called P3 that trains professional athletes at an elite level. Dr. Elliott has created this revolutionary gym based on his ability to tie his passion for athletics and academics into one dynamic and successful career. Please give Dr. Elliott a warm welcome. Uh, 
one. Here's one. Here's one. Can I do a front kick or sure. a flying side? Sure. How about a flying side? <laughs>
and then you're going to go take care of athletes. You know, why does that make sense? So I had people that thought it was an amazing thing to do, and I had people that thought it was a waste of my education. Um, but it's what I wanted to do. So I just so that's the track I, I stayed on. And now on the other side of it, uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, we, I feel like we can do almost anything we want in the space that we operate in. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some of the things we do in just a minute. We'll, I'll show you a couple of videos and uh, give you an idea of some of the uh, the, the, uh, the areas that we work in. Um, but I really feel like we can do almost anything we want right now. It's just a matter of picking and choosing what projects to get involved with. And Adam knows, I and mean, we have so many things coming out of it. Like, uh, like currently, right now, we've got a, you know, the NBA wants to start testing every basketball player for them, like using all these sports science models that we have, because nobody's really done this stuff. We're innovating. Everywhere we go, we have to figure out how to do it, because there's not a chance to follow anyone. And um, and so, again, I'll show you I'll show you some of it in a minute. In a minute. But the NBA wants to start studying every basketball player that goes into the league starting next month, so I think we're going to do this. And, uh, and Adidas uh, wants to set up a deal with us where we take all their top sponsored athletes. Part of this was inspired by Derek Rose. You know, he had an injury, uh, came back from the injury, and then he has another injury. And if he'd seen us, we were in conversation with him when this happened. But if he'd seen us, uh, almost certainly wouldn't have had the second injury. And so we'll get we'll get Derek Rose in here pretty soon, and uh, and uh, and we'll know everything about how he moves. It won't be a guess anymore. We'll we'll analyze a lot of him, know exactly how he works, and we'll make sure he works better when he comes back. Mm -hmm. uh, we're setting up a collaboration with Harvard Medical School right now. Suddenly, they're interested in sports science. You know, they weren't when I started there, but now they are. So we're going to start. We're starting research collaboration with Harvard Medical School. We just had uh, the head of the department out uh, like three or four weeks ago. Came out with uh, their uh, clinical director. So we're starting a relationship with them, and we're doing all that in this little tiny island in Santa Barbara. And uh, and that's you know I feel really lucky. It's a beautiful little town to live in, uh, but it's not compromising in any of my professional endeavors. Uh, by the way, you know, we were never supposed to stay here in Santa Barbara. I wasn't, I never thought that this would be a great place to train professional athletes. There's no pro sports teams here. There's a, I mean, it's a tiny little town. Uh, we were supposed to set up in Santa Monica, but I came up here after uh, a my eighth winter in Boston and uh, <coughs> sat up uh, above the mission looking off the water and thought, man, this would be a nice place to do this stuff. And, uh, and so that's, that's what we did. And it's, and it's all worked out pretty well. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show you a little bit of what we do here. Oh, by the way, uh, Travis said this would be a, this would be a, uh, a little bit smarter class, a little smarter group. And so this this presentation, unless I don't think Adam's altered at all, this is exactly I presented this to uh, Stanford Medical students uh, up at Stanford Medical School uh, six months ago. So this is this is gonna be the same stuff. We might have to, you know, we'll, we'll alter it a little bit if we need to. And I'll listen. Anybody can interrupt me. Okay, raise raise your hand if you have a question. You can you can interrupt me. It's a small enough group for it. So, uh, background, I pretty much gave you this. Uh, uh, since I started medical school, from the time I was 18, I was positive this is a track I was going to stay on. So everything I did was, was geared towards uh, studying how the body works, um, and especially in sport. Uh, this is our facility. We set up a place down here, down, right down by uh, State Street, down in the pump zone. And uh, we don't do any kind of promotional stuff. So even a lot of people who live here don't know we do this, but uh, in professional sports, uh, most people know that most everyone knows now uh, who we are and where we're at, and most everyone in pro sports uh, knows, pro, uh, knows, knows P3. Um, probably our calling card is we use all this technology to figure out how bodies work. You, know, you would think that in professional sports, the, uh, the training would be super cutting edge, right? You've got a kid that you just signed into a $100 million contract. You think that you would do everything possible to know exactly how he works and take care of him so he doesn't get broken. But the reality is it's still not done that smart. The reality is, and we've done this, you know, we work, I work with the, with the Patriots. We set up all the Patriots programs. We've done a ton of work in the NBA. Um, I was the first director of sports science in Major League Baseball. We worked in every sport at the highest level. And I can tell you, generally how it works is the professional athletes, they walk into the, or, how many of you guys play sport? All right, everybody almost. So, so uh, generally, how it works is the uh, you know major league baseball player walks into the the uh, the, uh, the big league training room, and uh, there's a there's a program up on the board on the whiteboard. And it's a program for everybody that day. That can't be the way to do this. All of our bodies are so unique, right? Does that make sense? You know, we could take we take two six eight, uh, 22 year old, about to be NBA players that jump the same height, they run the same speed, and their bodies are completely different. You know, one guy's hips are so tight, he can't use all this lower body power he has. He has to, now his back is starting to light up on him. 
and then we get this other guy, looks exactly like him, um, performs like him, but his issue is that he doesn't have enough lower body power, okay? He's really efficient at transferring power, but um, he just doesn't have enough. We need a bigger horsepower. So we treat those guys exactly differently, okay? It's a whole different model. And in the future, that's what's, that's what's gonna happen in pro sports. We use more technology to understand how bodies put together, and we'll, uh, and we'll customize all the programs. But it has, it's not how it's been done up until now. If we do it, if we understand the body that's in front of us, we understand all of its important features, you just, you almost never screw this stuff up. You almost always <coughs> build athletes that don't get broken, that have better performance uh, systems than, if, than before they showed up at your place. <coughs> so we try to take the guesswork out of it. Uh, just quickly, <coughs> philosophy in power sports. If, if you're, if uh, we've done a lot of work in endurance sports, uh, but mostly work in power sports now, uh, NBA, NFL, uh, uh, soccer, uh, any sport where you need a system that's going to have to outrun or outjump or somehow outpower another system. What you do is you build the biggest motor possible. You want to really, you want the most powerful athlete possible, and then you got to make sure they can use that motor in the sport. You can be really powerful, but you're still a crappy athlete. We see that all the time. Because they don't have a system they can use in their sport. What does that mean? I mean, if you're a baseball player and you jump 40 inches, but um, your hips are too tight or your ankles are too tight, you're not able to execute this rotational mechanics of baseball. And so we have to figure out that the only thing you need is to make that ankle loose. And once that ankle is loose, this power that allows you to jump 40 inches is going to be unleashed, and then you hit balls 500 feet. And that's the time that we feel smart, when we figure out exactly what's wrong with your body and make it work better. That's when we get to feel the smartest. But sometimes it's just like just one little tweak there, okay, now the system works beautifully. We've had, in every sport we work in, we've had a lot of the best athletes in sport come through. So, uh, you know, like this up, upcoming season, or I would say over these next four months, if you see um, seven foot guys walking around State Street, almost guarantee they're, uh, they're out visiting us. We have some of them right now that are getting ready for the NBA, uh, but this summer there'll be quite a few more. Uh, but in baseball, you know, the Ryan Brauns and uh, and uh, Pujols and uh, Gary Zitos and in the NBA, Darren Williams and uh, Derek Favors and I mean, on, we had a lot of the best guys in every single sport uh, come in and test it. And uh, and let me let me just give you this too. And some of you guys might get this, some won't. But what we do with these athletes, besides making them work better, besides testing them a whole lot figuring out how their systems work, is we store all their data. So we're establishing all these databases in pro sports that haven't existed. So now we have a database of NBA players uh, that lets us go in and say, okay, you're a 6'8 uh, 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 wing player. How do you compare to everybody else in the NBA? You know, we had the top prospect in China come through just last year. They call this guy the next Yao Ming. They fly him over, we test him, and we can show exactly how he stacks up against all the other uh, um, big men in the NBA. This is how the, the next Yao Ming looks relative to other, all, all the other uh, centers that we are playing with without having to put them in the NBA yet. They're trying to figure out when they put this 19-year-old kid in the NBA. And we get to tell them that he's not right. And that stuff just didn't exist until we started collecting uh, it. And it was a kid one that's not here. Watch how, watch how efficient this looks. This is just a normal hardwood floor. This kid's just learned how to create a kind of elasticity in his body. elasticity in your body, to be elastic, you watch the best athletes in the world and they just bounce. They have some spring in their body. And you can train that. I mean, most, most even, even in high school programs, they, uh, they, start, they start training plyometrics and doing some open movements. Uh, but you can train your body to have a whole lot more elasticity than it naturally has. And that's, that's one area we focus on. So that kid that was in slow motion doing, that kid when he came in, he was, he was really strong, but he had no bounce. He just, he ran through walls, but he, uh, but he, uh, he didn't move that great. And, uh, but he showed, he, three days a week for three years he showed up and then he moves great. And you know, how about he's playing it. He said, that was a young kid, that was a, uh, he's, in, he's in college now, but he would probably be playing soccer for a while, I assume he play professional afterwards. We got a couple other things for you. I'll show you some of the other, other ways. The thing that's happened, look at, 
here's what happened. So I, I said that you know at every step of the way there were some people that didn't uh, that thought it might be a waste of a world class education to, to go do what we wanted, what I wanted to do. Uh, but what what's happened is there aren't people that have my background that are standing in this area that we're in, in this area of uh, sports performance. And so there's lots of other opportunities that come to us. There's people that seek us out to do all types of different things. And if you're willing to persevere, if you're willing to kind of charge your own path, that generally is what happens. And you end up being kind of a unique person with unique uh, qualities in the space that you're operating in. So in our in our space, we get invited to do all types of things. Uh, what we do on a regular basis is we put all these electrodes on the surface of your brain, uh, and we uh, so you have all these electrodes that measure electrical activity on the surface of your, uh, surface of your skull, and we uh, and we have you do a performance test. We have these pro athletes do a performance test, and we look to see how the brain works. Do we tell if they tend to make if they make a mistake? Do they change their brain pattern? A lot of athletes do, and if they do, then they tend to make more mistakes. Uh, we can tell if they if they can deal with uh, if they deal with pressure. If we apply a lot of pressure to them, what happens to the ring? Some of the guys you can't see it. They just apply they apply some more resources and they deal with whatever pressure we give them. Other athletes they start they start cracking when we apply some pressure to them. Basically, speed up uh, taps and things. But we uh, if you look at people's brains, it almost sometimes it sometimes feels a little bit unfair that we get to look inside the brains because you learn a lot about them. the athlete, athletes learn to hide a lot, right? They learn to bluff a whole lot. And, uh, and we hook them up to these electrodes, and we can see exactly what's going on inside their heads, as opposed to what they're showing us on their face. Everything looks cool here, but it's not cool inside here. I'm going to see if I can, I'm going to try one more time on that. No, it's not, it's not, it's not linked out. Yet. This is a project we did uh, with K Swiss. <coughs> we uh, listen. I never wanted to build shoes, but uh, we we study uh, movement so much. It seemed like a natural extension of what we do. And so uh, Nike wanted to give us a sponsorship, but instead of doing that, I wanted to build some shoes. So we reached out to K Swiss. Uh, it's a Southern California company. And we told them we were going to make them. We were going to build a uh, better tennis shoe for them, which we did a couple years ago, and it was it was voted the best uh, tennis shoe of uh, 2011 uh, by a Tennis Magazine and mo most of the rating systems. Suggest they do, but they really don't. And so after we built these shoes for K Swiss, it worked out really well. Now we have a bunch of people coming to us that want to build shoes for them. And so that's, uh, um, you know, we're doing this deal, this deal with Adidas, but we also uh, we also just uh, signed a deal with the guy who used to be the head of innovation at Nike, uh, to start a shoe company. Um, and we're building the first shoes right now. We'll get a prototype in like three weeks. It's going to be cool. What uh, what makes our shoes different? First off, how, we kind of signed to build them. But you'll see. I mean, if you go, if you go to our, well, I don't know where you The company's going to be called Ampla, okay? Like Amplify. And, um, and the first shoes, here's what we did. We put um, uh, carbon, two carbon fiber plates in them, like this. And so basically, every time you every time you land, you're loading this carbon fiber plate, you compress this carbon fiber plate. And so you have a bunch of, you basically have this powerful spring underneath your foot. And then it helps with uh, heel lock. So it's kind of, you remember this, this kid, Oscar Pistorius, this runner, that's uh, probably a murderer? Yeah. Right? You know the guy? No? So uh, um, he, uh, he was born with uh, his genital uh, malformation where he had no lower leg, he had no tibias. And so uh, uh, he has, he has uh, carbon fiber prosthetics. From his knee down, he has uh, carbon fiber blades, and he ran in the last Olympics. I guess some of you guys must have seen this, right? Oh, yeah. 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 So, so this was partly inspired by Oscar Pistorius before he was murdered. Um, and, um, and so we have these, we put these uh, carbon fiber, these two carbon fiber plates inside the, uh, and the, the sole of the shoe. So every time you strike the ground, you load these carbon fibers, carbon fiber plates, and they help you, they give you some bounce, some free bounce. And uh, we're getting, uh, they're being tooled right now over in, over in China, and we're gonna, we're gonna get, we have to figure out how much bounce to give people. But, and so we're getting these shoes back that have pretty much bounce, that have a lot of bounce, that have a whole lot of bounce, that are really hard to compress. 
and we're going to see which ones uh, perform the best. And what we'll do is we'll take these shoes, and we'll put all the shoes on one person, and we'll look to see how it changes their performance. Right? So we use the athlete as, as, the, uh, as the, uh, the constant variable, and then we, uh, we use the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the shoes as, a, as a, the, uh, uh, the bearing variable, and we look to see how the shoes affect the athlete. Makes sense, right? What do you got? Going a little bit back to when we looked at the brain activity, what did you use that information for? When what? When you looked at the athlete's brain activity, what did you use that information for? So what do we use the brain activity for? You know, when we study athlete's brain. So so uh, we just we were asked this by the San Antonio Spurs GM uh, like three weeks ago when he came out with two of his athletes and we were measuring their brains. So what we do <laughs> is uh, say you have what we call a lousy air reset. Okay, let's say you're we, uh, 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 Vika, uh, Victoria Azarenka is number one, she was the number one ranked tennis player in the world. She trained on this uh, uh, a year ago in the fall for 18 sessions and then got really good mentally. What happens if, you, if you're a great tennis player, you have a chance to be the number one tennis player in the world, but you have a terrible air reset, which means you steamroll your opponents until you make a mistake, you hit a ball wide, and then you're like, hmm. and now, and then you shake another ball. and then. Your serve gets broken, right? You kind of start falling apart when you make a mistake. A lot of us do that. You know, we have an efficient pattern when we're winning, and then when we make a mistake, then we get in these crappy patterns. And so what we do is we set up this whole video game. Um, um, it, it's a whole video game scenario where you don't have a controller. You just you're, you're racing cars, you're flying spaceships based on the type of brain activity you're creating. Okay, and so. If, you, if your air reset, so you make a mistake, okay? You're racing a car, you crash into the wall, and you come out of that, and you, if you get into this lousy electrical pattern you normally get into, your car, just, your car just sits there. And if you're trying to play this game and you don't have any other way to make it go except to get in a, in a more efficient brain pattern, you find a way to get in an efficient brain pattern. Like, we can't tell you how to have an efficient brain pattern. You know, I can show you how to hit a serve, but I can't show you how to have an efficient brain pattern. You have to figure it out, but we tell you when you figure it out with the video game. I mean, it's like it's a plastic uh, operating condition. You know, we're rewarding you, we're punishing you um, to guide you to be better at this thing. And so we train the thing you don't do very well in a video game uh, format. Make sense? Yeah. There's no controller. Controller is just this thing. So the shoes. The shoe scenario is kind of fun. I mean, we really have, a, we have a, everybody wants us to build shoes with them right now. Really what we want to do is study new movement, but, uh, but it applies in shoes really well. So I think we'll do quite a bit in this space. This company, Ample, is funded by Quicksilver, which is a big company, um, and nobody's going to know that they're funded by Quicksilver, but they're a $3 billion company, and they want to get into the performance world. D90X. You guys, what do you got, man? Uh, those shoes legal, like, you know, you know, uh, shoes, like good question. <clears throat> Questions are: Are these shoes legal? I mean, if uh, if it's a, if it's a conversation, then you're probably doing something right. If people are saying, you know, those shoes might create too much of an advantage, then you're probably doing something right. So listen, if they get banned in the NFL and the NBA, um, you're going to want to wear them in high school. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's okay if, if it improves performance enough that it creates big advantages for people. Then I think we're doing something right. So we'll, we'll see. Hopefully, it'll be a problem. It'll be a controversy. <laughs> what, what do you have a lot of track runners here? What one thing can a track a runner do that you would teach in your gym? So they could be a better runner. Okay. There's other black track athletes here. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I, ended up, I, ran, I ran track in high school. Uh, after I, after I uh, hurt my knee because I couldn't move laterally, I, uh, I ran. Um, and I, I, we've done a lot of work with runners. We had, uh, we had uh, Allison Felix and a bunch of the, uh, the Olympic track athletes in for the last Olympic cycle. Um, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to give every type of uh, track athlete one piece of uh, advice and one exercise that's going to apply to all of them. I think this thing I said about relaxation, that's one thing that transcends your your, uh, your specific event. If you're an endurance athlete, you don't relax very well. Um, you're not going to be the best endurance athlete. If you're a, a sprinter and you don't relax well, you're definitely not going to be the best sprinter. Relaxation is so key to moving well. Every time, this is something we we study really hard. Every time you contact the ground, every time you land, when you're when you're sprinting, when you're jumping, 
when you have an approach in volleyball, every time you contact the ground, that's a chance to load these springs. And if you don't relax, you don't get a chance to load these springs. If you hold too much tension, if you're too much too worried about the next movement, if you're, if you're tightening up muscles too early, you don't get a chance to load these springs. If you don't load these springs, you don't get you don't have the bounce that all the best athletes have. So whether whether it's a springer or it's a, or it's a miler, um, uh, certainly the jumpers, you got to have a, you got to have a high level of relaxation. Those movements we, 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 I showed you in the video, uh, there was a couple of athletes doing these shadow movements where they were like they're contacting a box, they're up on these boxes going pop 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 That uh, that's a trained relaxation. That's a trained fire relax, fire relax, fire relax. Uh, but you can also work on just being conscious relaxation. There. I mean, hip stability, every athlete needs hip stability. You know, you guys are probably doing some stuff to work on hip stability. I'm guessing. I mean, most people know this, you know, working on stabilizing these things is really important in almost every sport. Uh, I mean, it's a big target for, for uh, uh, mostly not linear sports, but for, for all you athletes who do non-linear sports like soccer, volleyball, uh, uh, basketball, uh, ACL prevention. Uh, it's amazing how many ACLs you can prevent with a smart training program. And it's amazing how many people have their lives uh, uh, disrupted by having knee injuries. They could have been helped with the smart training program. So we just helped out. We helped out the girls' uh, soccer program here this last year just because somebody had to take it, and uh, they went from having an average of five ACLs a year to having zero ACLs this year. Uh, we just brought it. Did anybody play soccer here? Oh, okay, I saw those small. Okay, good. So, so. Um, there was one girl that just came in as a freshman that came in that we didn't work with that had an ACL. But uh, of all the kids that were in this ACL prevention with Luke, uh, none of them had ACLs. It's like you have to do that, if especially if you're in a girls' sport. You've got to reduce ACLs. You need to think, too. Every sport we work in, they have a different culture, right? Like, so the NBA guys are showing up right now. These college guys don't quite, aren't, aren't quite like the NBA guys yet. A few of them aren't. But the NBA guys, almost all of them have so much swagger. That they won't drink water out of out of uh, anything that they didn't somebody didn't take the top off of. You know they don't like drinking out of Dixie cups or anything like that. It's not going to happen. You know recovery a recovery shake. They're not going to. There's no way they're going to mix or shake something. Okay. They uh, they they want things that I don't know. This is how it is. Uh, hockey players they don't have any of that stuff. They have they just show up and they go they go brawl and you know eat some meat and potatoes and do it again the next day. I like those guys. <laughs> So uh, the question is, how, how do we, how, when we work with athletes that are injured, you know, I train in medicine, so I got a medical degree, and we have therapists that work with us. When we work with athletes that are injured, how is that different than working with athletes that are healthy? Um, I think the most, the, the most important piece here is that when you're injured, and all of, a lot of you guys probably have some type of injury in your life, you got to realize everything else works. You know, you can have a, an ankle sprain, you know, or you can have a slight, uh, slight knee injury or, or some toes tendonitis, and 99% of your body is good, it's ready to go. So you should go train the rest of your body to go be a performance body while we take care of the thing that's broken right now. So that's 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 probably the take home message. I can't tell you how many times we've got we've, we've had elite athletes go over our place and they're coming off of, say, a shoulder injury, and, um, and we test their shoulder and it's doing pretty well, but the rest of their body is, is terrible. It's because all they've been doing is rehabbing the shoulder. We have this kid, uh, Ennis Cancer, who uh, should be one of the best uh, big men in the NBA coming up. He's 21, getting ready for his fourth year in the NBA, or third year in the NBA, or in the middle of his third year. And, uh, and uh, this is the first year. He, he was, he was he's turning into a beast. And then this last year, whoop, he just took a big fall. We tested him right before training camp. We're like, it looks terrible. Nothing works. And, and it showed he had back problems, knee problems. So you got to take care of the rest of your body when you're injured. The rest of your body keeps getting better, even if, uh, even if you're rehabbing an injury. Listen, on the cultural thing, too, this was interesting. Last year, they, uh, a year ago, when they had the NBA lockout, we had a bunch of Major League Baseball players in, and basketball season didn't start when it was supposed to, so then we, we had all these NBA players that were uh, still left over that normally we'd send off to training camp, mixing with the Major League Baseball players. And we just figured they're all pro athletes, they're going to get along. It wasn't like that at all. They're like, uh, it was like oil and water. The, the baseball players are a bunch of, uh, you know, they're kind of like adolescents. They're like, probably like this kid right here, kind of. This guy. <laughs> they're, sorry. But they're, 
but they're uh, uh, just kind of they're kind of squirrely. They like have a hard time sitting still. I see your foot bumps around the whole time. And uh, and uh, and the uh, the basketball players are just suave, you know, They're cool. Like this kid over here with the hat on. That he's uh, doing with us. A great hat right there. That kid. So they like it was. They're like oil and water. Like the baseball players would be, always be together. The NBA players would always be together. They never they never really mix. You know, they're like different. They're like different animals. It's all cultural. There are all these little subcultures in pro sports. So yeah, shin splints. Um, that we talking about shin splints. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is what, what we think shin splints mostly come from. Are uh, in every sport you work in, how you interact with the ground is damn important. Okay. Every athlete we get in, these NBA players we have in right now, or these guys that are about ready to sign, uh, they uh, we work so much on how they interact with the ground, like ground foot interactions. And uh, if you have lousy ground foot interactions do bad things to your body, starting with your, your, your feet and, uh, and shins. And so most athletes that end up with shin, fins, shin splints, they, have, uh, they, have, they don't have great uh, ground foot interaction. So we work on that a whole lot. Like lots of repetitive small movements. Kind of make sense? Yeah. But we just tested, a, well, we just tested a guy, seven foot uh, kid that's about ready to start his NBA career. And um, uh, he's really passive. He's, he's a beautiful athlete for a seven footer. But he's really passive with his, uh, his ankle and feet. Every time he lands on the ground, his feet are just relaxed and they slap the ground. He slaps the ground with his toes. And after he slaps the ground, boom, he hits really hard. It's like a ton of force delivered through his body. And then right next to him, uh, we were testing this kid who was uh, played at UCLA one year, one and done, kid down at UCLA. Zach, what's his last name? Zach Levine. Zach Levine. Kid is a beautiful athlete. He's like 19 years old, jumps like a big deer. He is a beautiful athlete. He gets ready for the ground. He gets before he contacts the ground. He pulls his toes up. They're ready for action, and then oh, track athletes a lot of times we pop the dorsiflex. You guys, anybody talked about dorsiflexion? Sprinters, when we get Olympic sprinters in, so one athlete. That's the one group of athletes that have been taught how to interact with the ground, because you just don't win if you don't interact with the ground well if you're a sprinter. And so we spend a whole lot of time. This applies to every sport, by the way. We spend a whole lot of time training athletes not to land the toes down like this. A lot of times basketball players, tennis players think they're supposed to be up on the toes all the time. We teach them before they contact the ground, you know, if you're coming around for a foot strike, before you contact the ground, you pull your toes up into a ready position. That's like a loaded position. As soon as it contacts the ground, it's ready to load the spring and then drop. And the sprinters, almost, when we get a world class sprinters and they're always beautiful with their, their feet and ankles. But most athletes, not so much. So, I mean, that's the take-home message if you're an athlete, too. If you learn how to, before you contact the ground, you want to pull your toes up, especially if you're in a power sport where you can't be on the ground too long. If you're a jumper, if you're a, if you're a sprinter. What else do you got? Good? All right, guys, thanks. Uh, thanks. and maybe come back and intern with us uh, once you get off and start a college career.